There we go. Um, so welcome again. Um, this is the Your Voice Matters series. Um, so just to quickly introduce myself, um, my name is Megan. I'm taking over for Ashley um, moderate, or sorry, not moderating, but um, introducing all the lovely panelists and moderator. Um, and I am the Impact Programs Coordinator. So um, just, I don't know, Ashley, are we having trouble with the slides? I don't know if it's just my computer, but I'm just seeing a white screen. Is it, is it just me? Okay. We should probably, okay, perfect. There we go. Um, magic. So just, just to run um, over what, how the webinar works, um, this webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending out a link um, to the recording after the program wraps. Um, so for this webinar, we have a super full agenda, um, a lot of slides to get through, a lot of panel, amazing panelists. So we probably will not have time for questions at the end but we will be monitoring um, the chat function. So if you would like to ask a question, feel free to put it in the um, toolbar on the right-hand side. And Ashley will be um, sending those questions over to Evan. And, and if we have time and if it works with the program, we will certainly get those answered. But um, great. So now I will introduce our four panelists and um, moderator. So to start, we have Rima Ahmed, and um, she is a community organizer with experience in political, electoral and issue-based campaigns. Rima was born and raised in a multi-ethnic and multi-religious family in Milwaukee. She credits her strong belief in civic responsibilities and community-built power with social activism growing up, as well as coming of political age post 9-11 in a tight-knit American Muslim community with a history of educational outreach. Rima is passionate about creating the authentic relationships and mutual investments between diverse communities that will be essential in the next 30 years as the U.S. becomes a minority majority country. She firmly believes this job will be rooted in community organizing and driven by young people, paving the way for, the, for future generations to, to keep the baton moving forward. Um, so welcome, Rima. And next we have Kevin Ballin. And Kevin is Vote Early Day's program associate. Outside of Vote Early Day, he's a student at Harvard leading voter engagement efforts on campus. And previously, Kevin designed youth programs for the mayor of Boston and the YMCA. Um, next is Kira Fenzel. Um, Kira was the founding project director for the Civic Responsibility Project, working with companies of all sizes and verticals on building internal and external civic engagement programs that fit their brand identities and needs. She has dedicated nearly a decade of work to strengthening democracy and promoting voter participation, taking the lead in several key social impact areas she works to preserve election access and tackle civic participation projects, including issue advocacy work and corporate social responsibility clients. She specializes in advising partners in all sectors of emerging best practices and innovative tools so that they may run efficient and effective activation programs. Kira served as a project manager and research associate for the case study, Civic Responsibility, the Power of Companies to Increase Voter Turnout in 2019. She is based in Denver, Colorado. Um, next is Evan Hanser, who is our moderator, and Evan is the chef at Egg, a locally rooted breakfast restaurant in Brooklyn with an outpost in Tokyo and a farm in the Catskills. He is the co-author with George Weld, Egg's founder of Breakfast Recipes to Wake Up For, and the creator and curator of Tables of Content, which explores the intersections of food and literature. Evan works on food policy and advocacy with the Chef Action Network, and during COVID-19 pandemic has been coordinating food relief across New York City with Food Issue Group. And last but not least, we have Deborah Van Trees. Chef Deborah Van Trees doubles as one of Atlanta's hottest chef personalities, executive chef and owner of Twisted Soul Cookhouse and Pours in West Midtown Atlanta and the catering company by um, Van Trees. Chef Van Trees has been featured on Food Network, Travel Channel, Cooking Channel, NBC, The New York Times, HuffPost and BuzzFeed, among others. The intersection of food and culture is at the heart of Van Trees' cuisine which features creative modern interpretations of global influences on traditional Southern soul food. Chef Van Trees and her cuisine have won numerous awards, making her a sought after chef for top food brands, such as Big Green Egg, Ben & Jerry's, Sabra, Spiceology, and others. As a female African-American restaurateur, business owner, and member of the LGBTQ community, Van Trees is also passionate and vocal advocate for social justice and issues close to her heart. She supports education and action to encourage healthier eating habits among low-income households. 
She also wants to shine a light on food insecurity and other issues that impact vulnerable populations. In 2021, Van Treese will add published author to her career accolades when she releases her first cookbook, The Twisted Soul Cookbook. Um, so amazing. Um, thank you all for being here. And I will now pass it over to Evan. Thank you, Megan. Can everyone hear me? All right. I'm at Egg right now, um, and there's construction across the street, so apologies in advance if, if something uh, flares up in the background. Um, but yeah, I got in conversation with the Beard Foundation a couple years ago, uh, around early mid 2018, when we were doing some voter registration efforts at Egg, um, and I was looking to tie into uh, you know the Beard Network, but also to the folks who actually knew what they were doing around these issues, since we. All we had in mind was to set up a table and hand out some cookies and ask people to vote. And I didn't even know if that was legal. Uh, so we did it anyway, but luckily for everyone here today, you're going to be able to hear what you can do that you can feel confident about going forward. Um, Kira, Kevin, and Rima have all prepared slides and are going to give sort of high level looks at um, different issues in voting from early voting to uh, voter suppression. Um, and different state by state rules, but I do want to emphasize that this is an educational um, gathering. Nothing that you that you hear here here should be um, used as you know your your legal guidelines or anything. Every state has different rules, so it's really important wherever you are to know those rules and know um, the best way to go about uh, getting involved in voting and voter registration um, in your state. There are some resources here, um, as you can see, rockthevote.org. Uh, classic well-known voter registration site, um, really easy to use, can be used uh, to register online, I believe, from every, almost every state. Um, and then whenweallvote.org um, is another option. There's many others out there that have cropped up. You know, voter engagement, voter participation is an enormous uh, factor and um, point of conversation around this election in particular. Um, so I'm sure you'll find other research out there, but these are two that we know are, are pretty solid. Um, Obviously, the first step to uh, voting is to register. Second step would be to request a ballot. Uh, a lot of people due to COVID, of course, are considering voting by mail, uh, voting early. Um, and there are new different state-by-state -state regulations around how to go about that. So be sure to look into those based on your state. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time uh, because I'm not the one who actually knows anything about this. But I'm excited to hear from Kira, uh, Kevin, and Rima. And then at the end to chat with Deborah and our panelists um, about how we can get engaged as a culinary community in particular. Um, so to start, I'm going to hand it over to Kira Fenzel from Impactual to give an overview of registration, um, how to request a ballot, and issues around day of voting. So Kira, take it off. Hey, thanks so much, Evan. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kira Fenzel. I am the program director for Impactual. Um, Impactual is a social impact consulting firm. We help um, brands and causes and donors make an impact in our democracy. Um, and we're a nonpartisan firm. Um, we work with anyone that believes that we can make our society better. Um, and I'm really excited to share some of the work that we've been doing um, in the civic engagement space uh, to help guide you in making your impact in the 2020 elections. So let's jump in. So um, Evan covered a little bit of this, but um, the general election is just 68 days away, which is a lot closer than uh, it might even feel. Um, but if you're waiting until election day to make a difference, then you're missing some really key opportunities to both um, participate yourself and also to activate those in your network. So we call this the voter life cycle. There's five key ways that you can make an impact in the 2020 elections. Number one, you've got to get registered to vote. Number two, you need to make your plan to participate. Number three, you need to cast your ballot either by mail, by dropping it off in a secure drop box, by voting in person. Number four, you want to check in on your network and make sure that everyone has all of these different steps covered. And number five, if you can and, and you're able, um, serve as a poll worker. Uh, this is a, a new ask for 2020, but it's more critical than ever. So let's move on and dig in on these. Step one, you need to register to vote. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, sometimes you register to vote your first time and you feel like uh, you're covered, but especially during 
COVID-19 and with folks changing locations, being in new states, um, it's really important this year to double check that your voter registration is up to date. In most states, there are three options to register. One is registering to vote online, so you can use any of the tools that were linked in this presentation. Number two, you can register to vote by mail. This often means that you're going to your Secretary of State's website, printing up a form and mailing it in, or in your state, you might receive a voter registration form from an advocate or directly from your town clerk or your county clerk, and you can mail that form in. Or number three, you can always stop off at your local elections office, fill in a form, sign it right there and submit it. Um, voter registration deadlines vary by state, but we always say the best day to register to vote is today. Um, so once you are registered, um, it's really important for you to share the voter registration deadlines in your state, um, share that you have updated your registration and model good behavior. It takes two minutes or less. It is probably the quickest form that you can access um, from as far as government forms go. Um, and remind folks that if they've gotten married recently, if they've moved in some states, if they've missed an, an election or two, they need to update their registration. And so it's always better to be extra cautious and do a double check on your registration and make sure that you're registered at your current address with your current name. All right, next slide. Next is making a voting plan. So the plan, the, the most important thing with participating in an election is making sure that you have a plan that works with your schedule and with your, or especially folks that are highly exposed to COVID-19 or who are at risk of exposure or folks that just know that they want to participate early, um, you should make your plan to vote way in advance of election day. In some states, you need to request an absentee ballot to be mailed to you early on. Um, so you want to plan several weeks out in advance so that you're receiving your ballot in a timely fashion and you have plenty of time to return it. Um, you can, and I think Kevin is going to go into more detail about voting early, but in most states, you can register, you can request your mail-in ballot, but either online or by mail, or you can often go in person and do in-person absentee voting. Um, and in some states, you're able to request an absentee ballot by phone. Um, the best way for you to double check is to check your Secretary of State's website, or you can go to voteearlyday.org. Um, you can look up your polling place at gettothepolls.org. Um, and as soon as you vote, make sure that you share that you've requested your ballot and that you've turned it in. Next slide. Now, making your plan is great, but if you don't actually turn in your ballot, it doesn't count. And so if you wake up on the day after election day and you've gone through all of these steps and you have a beautiful filled out ballot on your coffee table, unfortunately, you have not met your goal of making an impact this year. It's really critical that you are giving yourself plenty of time to return your ballot. Um, we know now that there may be significant USPS delays in, in different states, particularly in rural areas. So if you're planning to vote by mail this year, you should make a plan to have your ballot back in the mailbox by October 20th. That is the soft deadline to feel really confident that your ballot will make it there by 7 p.m. on election day. If it's after October 20th and you still want to vote, you should not despair and you should not skip out on the election because it's October 21st or November 3rd. Um, you should see if you have a drop box option in your state um, so that you can just drop your ballot off in a secure drop box. And often those are open to anyone in your county. Um, that differs on a state by state basis. Or you can always go vote in person at your local polling place on election day. Um, so make sure that your plan includes actually making time to go vote. Uh, making a plan to vote on election day should be kind of your um, backup safety plan because you never want to have traffic or weather or power outages um, or a family emergency be the reason why you're not able to vote. So take advantage of the long timeline that most states have to participate um, and make your plan and, and cast your ballot way in advance of election day. Next slide. Um, so the next important thing here is activating your network. So we, we have the power in ourselves to multiply our votes 
by three to four people very easily. Um, and the folks on this call have huge networks that can be activated to participate in elections. 90% of people trust suggestions from family and friends and folks in their personal networks. So word of mouth activation is one of the most powerful tools for civic engagement in existence. That means that you should be making sure that you're talking to your friends, family, your coworkers, your employees, and your customers about these key activation dates. We've um, boost up these different holidays that are incredible events um, that help us just be aware of deadlines that are approaching. So National Voter Registration Day, that's coming up in just a few weeks on September 22nd. Um, that's a great day to remind folks to register to vote, to double check their registration and make sure that they're all set to participate. Vote Early Day, which Kevin's gonna talk more about on October 24th, that's a great opportunity to make sure that folks that have that ballot sitting on their coffee table are turning it in way in advance of election day. And then of course on election day, we wanna make sure that we're reaching everybody that hasn't gotten a chance to participate yet and make sure that they're taking advantage of in-person voting. And in some states in person, same day registration, if that's an option. Um, there's also ways once our entire networks are activated uh, to help folks in other states or in other communities um, leading up to election day and on election day. Um, Pizza to the Polls is a great organization that um, helps voters in long lines, and we're anticipating long lines in a lot of in-person locations um, by feeding them and encouraging them to stay in, in line if they've gotten there at 6.50 p.m. and they might have a several hour wait, but they have an opportunity to vote if they stay in line. So there's an opportunity to partner with Pizza to the Polls if that's something that interests you. You can also donate directly to Pizza to the Polls and they will send pizzas um, and food trucks to uh, key um, precincts that we are anticipating long lines in. And then you can also um, pop, uh, share the 866 Our Vote hotline, which is um, a place for voters who have questions on election day or who see issues at their polling place. Um, both utilizing 866 Our Vote and also sharing that hotline um, is a great way to make sure that folks have um, clear access to reputable and, and helpful voting information. Next slide. Last but not least, um, this year we have a new problem in the civic engagement space, but one that's, that's very solvable. Um, so poll workers tend to be um, traditionally uh, older individuals who have been working as poll workers for years and years. Um, but those folks also tend to be the folks that are at highest risk for complications associated with COVID-19. And we're seeing many poll workers um, say that they don't feel comfortable serving this year or they, they are not able to due to health concerns. So there is a national poll worker shortage. Um, in Austin, for example, during their runoff election, they typically have about eight poll workers they need to replace. This year they had 80 and that's in just one city. So we have a real need to ensure that folks that are healthy and are able to serve as poll workers um, and have less of a concern of exposure um, are serving as poll workers in their counties. Um, most, uh, you know, most poll worker shifts are a full day long, but you do get paid and you do get free food. Um, it's a great opportunity to get a better understanding of the civic engagement process. Um, and most counties have requirements of um, folks party and independence to all service poll workers. So it's a great opportunity to serve in a, in a bipartisan fashion, meet your neighbors and, and really dig in on um, how the civic engagement process works on the state side. Um, your requirements as a poll worker is to sign up. Um, so you can sign up through powerthepolls.org. They'll follow up with um, some instructions um, and then attend a training. It, it usually is going to be virtual this year. Um, but it might be an in-person training prior to election day, and then you'll be scheduled to serve on or before election day by your local clerk. All right, next slide. So the biggest takeaways here are number one, to plan ahead. Um, so if you know your plan to vote, you should just take action. As soon as we hang up from this webinar, you should go and double check, check your registration. As soon as your registration is set, you should request your ballot. As soon as you get your ballot, you should turn it around and mail it back in um, and, and make sure that you're following your plan and you're holding other folks accountable to their plans as well. 
Number two is that we have a wide range of options and more options than ever this year for voting. So you should utilize options that fit your lifestyle. If you're somebody that needs to utilize in-person registration and go vote in person on election day, you should absolutely do that. If you don't feel like you need to have an in-person voting experience, take a burden off of your local elections office and vote early so that they have extra time to tabulate and you're giving some relief to those long lines on election day. Um, number three is to take care of your people. Um, rules and deadlines and options are changing in states. You have the opportunity today to be connected to all of us. We are available to answer questions for you. So make sure that you're relaying that information um, and being a conduit to resources for the folks that you care about. And number four is to ask questions. Um, in some states, rules are changing very quickly and, it, and the voting process can be confusing, but it doesn't have to be. You can reach out to any of us. You can also use the voter hotline at 866-R-VOTE to ask questions. And we are here to help you vote no matter who you vote for. So um, that's the conclusion of my piece here. It's such a pleasure to be connected to all of you. It's really exciting to see the culinary community really embracing civic engagement. Um, on the last slide here, I have my um, contact information. Feel free to email me with any questions or follow up. And of course, here's um, impactful social handles um, in case you would like to reach out to us there. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, I actually just registered to be a poll worker in this city, which I've never done before. And I, I know a lot of people are considering it for the first time. Um, but I wanna kick it over to Kevin because one of the biggest things, as we know, is, is voting early. So um, how do we go about that? Why is it important? Um, and what, what, should we, what should we try to know before we give it a shot? Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks so much, hey everyone. Uh, Kevin from Vote Early Day. Um, Vote Early Day is a new civic holiday, as Kira mentioned, scheduled for Saturday, October 24th. Um, and it's a national day of action around voting early, whether that be by mail um, or in person, early voting options. Um, next slide. So a little bit about why we created Vote Early Day. Um, 200 million Americans are eligible to vote early by mail or in person without excuse. Um, but most, folk, most folks don't know that. Um, and also the, the rules to vote early vary state by state, community by community, and cause lots of confusion and prevent voters from casting their ballots. Next slide. Um, voting early is great for many reasons that were already mentioned. Typically, voting early reduces lines on election day and, and strain on election offices and also ensures that sort of busy schedules or last minute problems aren't getting in the way of, of ballots being cast. Um, we actually created Vote Early Day before the pandemic hit, um, but sort of have seen interest balloon given that voting early by mail and in person just gives this sort of um, choice to Americans that folks don't have to choose between their health um, and their civic duty. Next slide. Um, voter registration is, is awesome and gets highlighted very often, um, but it's only half the story. In the 2018, uh, 2018 election, 70% of Americans were registered to vote, uh, but only 50% were turning out. And so we're losing a lot of voters at the margin that are not making it to the polls for a whole variety of reasons. And we want to give them as many opportunities as possible, as many reminders as possible, um, and have as many sort of days of action to make sure that people are making it all the way from registration to ballots being cast. Next slide. Um, Americans really like voting early. It's already very popular. 40% um, of Americans voted early in the 2016 election. There are states that conduct all male elections and all those folks are voting early. College students, folks that are living abroad, military members are really used to voting early and have sort of done so without any national celebration or calls to action. Um, polling shows that voters really do like options. It you know, increases the likelihood of someone actually turning out to vote when they know there's multiple different ways to make it happen. Um, voting early is safe and secure, and people really respond well to, you know, being able to cast their ballot safely and in a way that, where they know it's going to be counted. Um, and voting early is rapidly increasing. Bipartisan Secretary of State support um, is sort of increasing voting early options day by day and making it easier and, and giving um, just sort of a whole new multitude of options to voters. Next slide. Um, so basically, given all this information, to voting early, sort of past success around voting early, and learning from some previous sort of holidays in the voting space, whether that be National Voter Registration Day or, you know, similar sort of civic holidays like Giving Tuesday, we decided to build the first ever Vote Early Day. Um, Vote Early Day is scheduled 10 days out from Election Day on a Saturday for a couple of reasons. It's a day in which most Americans are eligible to vote early. Um, it's 10 days out, so, you know, interest is really high in elections. It's two days after the final debate. And it's also on a Saturday to increase flexibility. You know, there's a lot of folks that 
aren't able to vote um, because they're working during the week. And so this Saturday and the weekend um, gives people additional options as well. Um, obviously, we want to sort of have everyone do things as early as possible this year. And so on vote early day itself, our call to action is submit that ballot um, or head to the polls early in person. Um, and the idea is that throughout the entire month of October, we're pushing, you know, voting early, requesting those ballots, making that plan as soon as possible so that on October 24th, you're ready to cast your ballot and make your voice heard. Next slide. So what Vote Early Day actually is, is it's, it's a, a movement of businesses, nonprofits, election officials, influencers, tech companies. We're basically getting as many folks as possible across the country, big and small companies, um, restaurants, chefs. Folks in the food industry are perfect for, for celebrating Vote Early Day um, to mass market voting early. Make sure that Americans know their options, create celebrations, um, you know, push folks to vote early, make a plan before Vote Early Day, and then actually on Vote Early Day, go ahead and cast that ballot and do this sort of, you know, election day buzz and celebration before election day. So that, you know, throughout the, you know, election day isn't just a single day in November, but it's an entire season of celebration. It's an entire season of sort of civic excitement going forward. Next slide. Um, oh, I might have skipped over. That's okay. Um, so, oh, that's great. No worries. You can go to the next one. Um, so, a couple of ways that folks can be involved of vote early, involved in Vote Early Day. Um, one is hosting celebrations on Vote Early Day itself. Um, so, on October 24th, that could be Zoom celebrations. Um, that could be sort of socially distant celebrations in person. In an example, at a, a restaurant that we heard about is a Vote Early Day ice cream flavor. Um, really great way to sort of, you know, create celebrations, create sort of like civic momentum, have some sort of, you know, key, key moment on October 24th. Um, a second way is spreading the word through a whole variety of different platforms. So we will have rolling out very soon a vote early tech tool um, that I'll show some pictures of a little bit later. And this tech tool will allow voters to head on, input their address, and then it'll spit back out options to vote early, both in person options and mail options. The tool will allow you to make a plan to vote early in person. Um, it will also help you facilitate the vote by mail process. Um, in many states, you can actually email in your ballot request forms, and our technology allows you to actually e-sign some of those ballot requests and reduce a ton of barriers for folks that don't have printers or, or stamps and envelopes at home. Um, another key way to spread the word is through swag. So all of our Vote Early Day partners, and I'll talk a little bit about signing up later on, will receive swag bags with buttons, stickers, posters, masks, banners upon request. Um, and just putting up a poster in a public location is perfect for spreading the word about voting early. It'll direct folks to our tech tool. It'll remind individuals about the holiday. Um, and so that's a you know, perfect way to activate. If you have a public space, stick up a vote early day poster um, to make sure that people are knowing about their options uh, moving forward. And the final way is ballot research and plan making. So we want voters um, to make plans before election day. Um, that could be through SMS texting. That could be through, again, just like having promotion earlier in October with Vote Early Day's tech tool. Um, you know, throughout the month of October, we have suggested activation dates um, as folks are coming into restaurants or public spaces, asking if they have made their plan to vote and pointing them in the direction where they can do so um, to make sure that they're making those plans and are ready to vote on October 24th. Um, so this is a couple of pictures of our tech tool, just so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, has tons of great functionality. On the next slide, you can see um, sort of the reminders that are sent out through the tool as well. It'll help people make plans, send you SMS reminders, so lots of great ways to make sure that folks' ballots um, are being casted and people are reminded about their deadlines. Get on to the next slide. Yep, so those are just a couple of the ideas that I mentioned earlier. Um, and next steps going forward is signing up as a Vote Early Day partner. Um, to receive our swag bags, we have an initial deadline on September 1st. Um, which is next Tuesday. So I recommend signing up as soon as possible on our website. Vote Early Day participation is ownerless. It's free. It's creative. You get access to toolkits and webinars. Our partners are doing wild things across the country like Vote Early Day ice cream flavors or like flying banners in the air and public, you know, on, on, on college campuses. Um, Vote Early Day is going to be on Snapchat and Twitter and tons of other great places. So we're really just trying to saturate the country um, to make sure that people know their options. And, and we'd love to have you join us. Thanks so much, Kevin. I know a lot of people are thinking about that right now, and that makes it feel so much easier just to be able to have the process sort of laid out for you. So thanks for sharing that. And I want some vote early day ice cream as soon as possible. Um, <laughs> um, so Rima, obviously a lot of this discussion about um, voter registration, making sure you're able to get there, have a plan, 
uh, whether that's to vote earlier, vote in person, is to make sure your vote is counted. I know Movement Voter Project does a lot of work on making sure votes are counted and people are able to exercise their right to vote uh, in many states, but particularly in Wisconsin, which we all know is a critical state uh, in, in this election. Um, can you tell us more um, about what Movement Voter Project is doing and what sort of things we should look out for as far as um, voter suppression and voter rights? Yeah. Um, hi again, everyone. Thanks so much um, for taking interest and being engaged in the um, election cycle this year. We know it's going to be really critical. Um, so yeah, it's just some quick overview about uh, Movement Voter Project. Uh, we're a donor advising platform. And so what we do is we help donors and funders identify some of the most critical grassroots groups doing essential work in battleground states. Um, so we're talking about groups that are on the front lines of change in their communities and we help them get access to resources that means grants that means really neat tech tools like we've already seen laid out here um, and basically plug in um, plug into this election cycle to engage communities but also really critically um, continue to organize well beyond these election cycles because we know that um, organizing year-round is really how we get change that our communities need and so yeah MVP helps identify those groups and um, connect them with those resources so I'll talk a little bit about uh, voter suppression broadly but then definitely want to share just how some of this played out um, earlier this year in Wisconsin we were the first state in the country to have an election during the pandemic and so we saw a lot of this um, play out so Again, quick background in voter suppression. Um, when folks think about voter suppression, they may think of Jim Crow. So we're talking about poll taxes and literacy tests, but certainly voter suppression still exists today. Um, and it takes many different forms. So this may be in different states, uh, voter ID laws. Um, so requiring that a voter um, show a government issued ID in order to be able to vote, in order to be able to register. And what we see is that the US Government Accountability Board actually estimates that having voter ID laws reduces voter turnout by two to 3%. Um, and in a period of time where our elections are so close, I'll say in Wisconsin, the presidential election in 2016 was decided by 0.7%. So reducing voter turnout by two to three percent changes elections changes who is actually um, put into office and governing our country our city our state um, so this has a huge impact on democracy and over 21 million u.s citizens don't have a government issued id so we're talking about real people who are not able to get access to uh, to voting um, and in wisconsin unfortunately we do have a voter id law and we've seen this play out um, this also then plays out in terms of voter registration restrictions and how you provide proof of residency. Um, and again, I'm talking about Wisconsin, but um, you see this all across the country. Another way that voter suppression shows up is limiting early voting hours and restricting restricting absentee voting. So unfortunately, just earlier um, this summer, a few weeks ago, we had a circuit court that limited early voting in Wisconsin to only the 14 days prior to the election. Um, and this was a huge disappointment because many groups on the ground were preparing to engage with um, local election administrators and clerks to be able to expand voting opportunities. And here you had a, cur a court come in and limit that. Um, so that's huge. Um, voter purges are another way that this shows up. Um, again, there are many states that have experienced this. Um, you know, I know some colleagues out in Georgia have talked about this extensively. We actually have a stay on a, um, a voter roll purge in Wisconsin uh, that would have removed almost 100,000 voters from the voter rolls out here. Um, and then another way that this shows up is um, gerrymandering. Um, and I won't go into too many details around that, but generally speaking, um, what we're talking about here is how representation for everything from Congress to state houses and state senates um, is allocated. Um, and this again happens every 10 years and we're going into a period of redistricting all across the country in the new year. So um, this is gonna be pretty heavy on folks' minds right after this election. And how did this show up in reality in Wisconsin? Um, I don't know if any of the um, slides that I had with pictures are able to show up, um, but what we saw in um, Wisconsin leading up to our April 7th election was that in the two weeks leading up to the election, 
the where and the how and the when of voting changed no less than six times. So as you had people experiencing stay at home orders, getting scared because you know we have this pandemic and unsure of you know how you can be safe, children staying home from school, you also had misinformation about how you can vote, whether election, um, whether polling sites would be open on election day, um, what is the process for requesting a ballot, um, whether or not you needed a signature. I mean, I can go on and on here. And what that meant was you had grassroots groups that were on the ground trying to uh, disseminate the, you know, updates on how and when and where to vote in real time. Um, but on election day, um, ended up having lines of voters um, outside of polling sites. And in Wisconsin, just in the city of Milwaukee, where we traditionally have over 180 poll sites open on election day, there were five polling sites that were open. So if you can imagine already, um, you know, wanting to physically distance, wearing a mask, being safe, and only having five uh, polling sites that you had access to, to be able to vote. Um, it was outrageous to say the least. Um, so those are some of the ways that the voter suppression showed up. And I'll say what we can do about it right now, because um, in Wisconsin, we had a test run that really um, was an example that um, states all the, over the country um, can look to for what to do and what not to do. Um, some of the lessons that we have learned um, are threefold, I'd say, is one is um, around election administration. Clerks are powerful. We have 1,852 election clerks for every municipality in the state of Wisconsin, and they have a lot of flexibility to do things like expanding voter out, voting hours, um, expanding access, and getting creative in how um, voters can come to the polls. So we saw on the April 7th election that in some municipalities, clerks allowed drive up early voting. Um, in another municipality, um, all voters in that um, city were mailed absentee ballots, you know, preemptively without having to go through the process of first requesting that ballot. Um, so there is a, a lot um, of power that these clerks hold and groups are organizing those clerks to be able to expand voter access. Um, voter education is another um, opportunity for us right now, and voter, specifically education from people you know and trust. You may have heard this phrase before, but a lot is um, being depended on um, for, from trusted messengers. So we're talking about community organizations that people know already, that they already go to for information. We need to make sure that we're supporting those organizations because those are the organizations that community members are going to to get information that's up to date. When they hear that, you know, election day is canceled or you know, some other outrageous claim that we know to be false. Um, we need to make sure that the organizations that actually are providing real information can, um, you know, can actually provide that to uh, community members. Um, and then protecting election day and Kira and Kevin already spoke a lot to this, right? We know that we need to expand all the different ways that people can vote, certainly encourage people to vote absentee, encourage them to vote early, but we also need to ensure that election day is protected um, for all those that, you know, waited out or maybe never received their absentee ballot, couldn't get around to vote early, um, but still want to cast their ballot. And so um, encouraging folks that are able to safely um, work the poll to go and do that, um, and also supporting organizations that are distributing PPE to voters who do end up going out on election day is going to be critical. Um, and with that, I know we've got some questions and I want to make sure we're able to get to that. Um, but thank you again. Um, I just, the last thing I'll say is that we really do need to support those grassroots groups that are in community. They are going to be our lifelines between, um, you know, the, uh, um, institutions that are disseminating information around elections and the very voters that we want to turn out. So it's gonna be very critical we continue to invest in them. Um, and thank you again um, for having us. Thanks very much. So Deborah, I wanna to turn to you as, as another chef, you know, uh, someone who runs a business that's a central part of a community where you have strong connections to your customers. Um, obviously these are relationships that we care about as we run, run restaurants. You know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you engage as a chef in your community around voting and, and why it's so important for you uh, as a restaurant or a small business owner, but also as sort of a leader in the community to encourage and support voting? Um, yeah, it's, it's, that's a, it's a big question um, with lots of answers to it. You know, first of all, as a business owner, um, 
everything that we do is really based on the government and who's in charge from the moment we get permits pulled you know where we can we can build where we can open how we open all of that is based on who is in office and who is in charge our accessibility to food um, to good food you know the relationship of food to our environment um, all of this you know all of these are reasons why we have to uh, be very diligent about voting and making sure um, that we're very vocal about it um, and our relationship to it uh, within the community uh, gosh you know for me it's it's the food accessibility it's the inequalities um that come with with food with our industry with so many things with our institutions um you know the food industry you know typically you know we have been thought of as as probably employing you know the less desirables are you know those who are not um fully educated in some people's opinions um, the immigrants, you know, but we employ hardworking people um, who, you know, are here to have a, a good life, a life like anyone else. Um, and it is imperative that we make sure that we have leaders um, that understand that, um, you know, that we we all want better for ourselves, and we have to, you know, make educated decisions on on how to make that happen. You know, I know it is a picture that looks different to so many people um, on what that means. But, you know, I know for me, you know, going, you know, maturing and, and learning, you know, um, to educate myself before I even hit that ballot. You know, I'm sure all of us have made uh, the mistake of walking in and there's a million people you have never heard of on the ballot. There's a million things you've never heard about. Um, and so, you know, for me, I'm constantly engaging my staff, engaging, you know, my community for us to discuss this, to us to, for us to discuss the issues um, that are on the table and what they are and how do we fix it. Um, now we are going through so much as an industry uh, trying to just survive and we're watching you know, our fellow chefs, our friends, you know, just fall by the wayside and we're fighting, we're fighting hard and we have to fight for them. Those of us who are still surviving, those of us who are wanting to come back. And right now, the biggest voice that we have is through, through voting and casting that ballot on that day. Um, here in, in Atlanta specifically, uh, you know, when I went to vote this last go around, you know, I experienced probably for the first time firsthand voter suppression. You know, I'm one of those people who months before, you know, asked for an absentee ballot. It did not show up, you know, but, you know, ironically, I did myself, my wife, my daughters. My daughter, though, has a Buckhead address, which is, you know, the right zip code. Hers came with no problem. You know, me and my wife, we never received ours. You know, then came the, the, you know, hassle of trying to find out where do I go? I actually went to three different places, staying in three lines for over 45 minutes to an hour before I finally got to the right place and was able to cast my vote. You know, so, you know, voter suppression is real, you know, with my employees, um sometimes they're you know they're afraid um because they don't feel that they are educated enough to be doing this and it's their right to vote and so you know it's a responsibility for us who know to talk to them to show them how um and if if it takes me you know telling them to come along with me because we're actually going to be closed that day and we're going to pay our employees regardless um, we just want them to get out and, and vote um, and, and let their voices be heard and not just, you know, talk, talk in the kitchen. It's like there we've got we've got strength here. So we have to make use of the power that we have. And that's with voting. That's amazing. I mean, that, that example of, you know, facilitating your, your employees ability to 
take that day, commit to voting, and, and not have to worry about losing ship, losing money. I mean, that's such an issue for so many, which I know is part of the reason voting early is a, is a big factor. Um, I'm wondering if there are other ways, you know, now that our restaurant spaces maybe are limited in our capacities to gather, you know, as we may have used them in the past, we've used egg space for phone banking or for, you know, airing debates or having conversations of, you know, what are some of the tools that you're finding uh, useful to reach your employees or networks? Like how, how are you finding effective ways to share that information that you have to do that, that work of educating and advocating for voting? Um, Deborah, and then maybe if, um, Kira, Reem, or Kevin want to follow up about some other ideas about how chefs can engage um, with their communities right now. Um, okay, so presently, you know, we're going into <laughs> what would what would normally be called festival season. Um, you know, unfortunately, it looks a little different. It's totally reimagined right now. You know, but for us, you know, we're using every opportunity, every platform that you know I possibly have you know, to talk about where we are, um, you know, as an African-American female, <laughs> you know, lesbian in this business, there's always room for conversation. Um, you know, so I, I take advantage of that every chance that I get. Um, we are also, you know, within house, you know, we have a couple of events that we're sponsoring within our own realm within our restaurant. Um, and a part of that is, you know, we have some some little cards, some literature that we'll be passing out, that we're constantly passing out at festivals. I did an event this past weekend. Um, you know, it became part of the conversation, you know, even though it was around beer, you know, it doesn't matter. It's, it's you know, it's something that has to be put at the forefront of people's minds. And you know, we are a society, you know, of social media and trending. Um, and so we have to make sure we make this trending right now so that you you want to be a part of this club of those who vote, you know, and you're not sitting back saying it's not for you or it's not going to change anything. Um, you know, so for me, you know, there's just every platform that I have, I'm trying to utilize it you know, and, and talk about it, you know, especially um, to the young people, you know, um, so many people who are young who work with me and just to get them on that conversation and away from, you know, things that don't matter, you know, right now, who's the number one rapper, you know, um, who's playing football, who's not, and get them focused on something that, you know, they actually uh, can make a difference on. Um, it's just important, you know, to take advantage of it right now. Yeah, and doing it around food or over beer, right? You know, like normalizing, talking yeah. about being engaged in the process instead of only talking about things like sports or culture, the things that we are part of our everyday lives, you know, engaging in our political system should be a part and as normal yeah. as drinking. Um, obviously, we have a long way to go. Um, but <laughs> yes. Rima, Rima, Kira, Kevin, anything to add to that about ways chefs um, in particular might be able to engage with their communities around this? Yeah, I can offer. Um, first of all, yeah, I just want to thank you so much, Deborah, on um, you know, giving your team the time off too on election days. I think that's huge and time off that they are paid for. Um, you know, I'd have Two other um, suggestions, ideas is one, uh, make sure to educate yourself on what is, you know, on what are the voting rules and requirements in your city, um, state, because they do vary <laughs> significantly. Mm -hmm. um, but two is to connect with local grassroots groups. And um, if you're looking for ideas, um, our website, movement.vote, um, um, lists out plenty of grassroots groups. And so if you could connect with those grassroots leaders and maybe give them space um, on your social media handles for the day for um, during the get out the vote period or on election day itself, I think that would be huge. And just to uplift something Kevin was talking about, swag is great also. If your um, folks in your restaurants can wear the different swag um, mm -hmm. you know, that's offered by these great other organizations, I think that would be really great. I think that's great. I think building a culture of voting is is super huge. And I think the restaurant industry has a great opportunity to, you know, despite in a lot of states us having to miss festival season due to um, social distancing, um, we can still make election day feel 
closer to a festival. If you have, if you adopt a polling place and do a party at the polls, that has been shown to be a really effective tool to encourage folks to actually walk up to the polling place to stay in line, um, making it a positive experience. Another um, opportunity is, you know, one of the biggest inhibitors for young voters right now to be able to register to vote and request an absentee ballot is lack of access to printers. They're not on college campuses. They don't have a printer at home. Um, if you're doing takeout orders and you can attach a voter registration form and attach an absentee ballot request form to all of your takeout orders, that's a great way to get those forms into people's hands and save them two weeks of, um, you know, bureaucracy of having to then reach out again to their clerk and then get another piece mailed to them and then reach out again and get another piece mailed to them. And instead they can stick it in an envelope and mail it in right away. Um, and, and that's a way to just help folks be prepared for election day. Um, that's a super tangible tactic. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> Is that okay? Um, yeah, because one of the things that I, I realized when I was out there this last time, it was hot. I just wanted some water. And I thought at one point, you know what, just leave, go buy cases and cases. Maybe someone will keep your, your spot. You know, is that something that we're able to do? Is there any rule law that says, no, you can't, you know, just go to the polls and hand out ice water? Um. So Pizza to the Polls has a ton of legal guidance on this because that is their model to help voters in most states. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so definitely consult with experts and consult with their lawyers and your own lawyers. Um, in most states, you are able to um, provide comfort to folks, whether as long as it is equally applied to folks who are voting and are not voting. So proximity to a polling place and providing entertainment and comfort is, is totally fine. If you're saying, if you go vote, I will give you a taco, that's usually where the line is drawn. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, I love that idea. like, you know, at Chefs right now, where we're doing a lot of outdoor service, a lot of to-go delivery, right? Like bringing food to a polling location or drinks to a polling location or something, setting up a, you know, lemonade stand or something like that. You know, what a great way to like engage your community, see people outside mm -hmm. and, and maybe incentivize people to get there. On the flip side of incentivizing, Rima, I'm wondering what, um, you know, I, I think some people may, may, if they're in a situation where they feel like there's some suppression or something going on, uh, not know to how to engage. Are there guidelines for um, what someone can do if they feel something's happening that's, that shouldn't be happening um, at the polls? Yeah, certainly. Many organizations and the ACLUs, what comes to mind first, will have poll watchers at polling sites all across the country this election cycle for the very purpose of ensuring that um, voters' rights are um, are protected and um, nothing fishy is happening. And so um, many times they'll be wearing vests polling site. So if you are able to recognize somebody with you know, ACLU or another organization um, on their vests, um, certainly feel free to go up to them and ask. Um, but otherwise, the ACLU does have a hotline that you can find online to be able to report um, if there is um, a, an experience of voter suppression or disenfranchisement that you've uh, witnessed. Great. Such an amazing organization. Like They do everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know we only have a few minutes left. I want to just point everyone's eyes back to the know the state rules, deadlines, laws document. If you haven't had a chance to sort of take in that information, you know, state by state rules are different. So you want to be aware of, of what the rules are out there. Um, and before we go, I just wanted to ask, you know, let all the panelists maybe chime in if there's anything in particular, I guess on the one hand you're concerned about um, in terms of voting this year or, or what, what are you really excited about as far as voting in, in 2020? Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Deborah, and then we can work our way to uh, Lima Kira. <laughs> uh, what am I really excited about? Um, change, just change. Um, you know, I, I am. I don't know. You know, in the present state that we are, you know, how I can survive this. Um, you know, I, I want to feel proud about where I live again. And the only way for that to happen is change. And that comes with, with voting. Uh, Rima? Yeah, I'll say that um, 
polling in Wisconsin has showed that voters in this election cycle are systems change voters. And I find that to be super inspiring. People are going to come out and they're going to engage in voting this year because they want to see that systemic change. And then almost um, equally exciting is that they're going to stay hopefully engaged in the process of creating that change long after this election um, and election year, hopefully. So um, that's my silver lining right now. And Kira, how about you? So I, I think I'm both I see this as a opportunity 2020. I think that we have um, an opportunity here to have record breaking participation if um, trends from the last few years are any indication. Um, but we also have a huge challenge in that COVID-19 presents a lot of difficulties for election administrators and for advocates um, and for voters. And so it's gonna take all of us working together, doing our part, doing everything that we can to encourage and help each other participate this year. Um, and I think that if we all, you know, chip in, we can really make a difference. And Kevin, what are you, what are you excited about? Yeah, I'm really excited about all of the, the new faces that have sort of entered the voting space, whether it be um, athletes or chefs or businesses or new nonprofits. And I'm really excited that on November 4th, the day after Election Day, to sort of continue the work with all of these folks and making sure that we're building systems for full participation in our society. Amazing. Um, we're just about at 3 o'clock. Megan, I don't know if there's anything else you want to chime in from on the JBS side. Um, but yeah. I want to Thanks to all of our panelists for being here. Thanks to JBF for letting me be a part of it. I learned so much listening to everyone um, here, and I'm even more excited about voting than I was an hour ago. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Evan, for leading such an amazing conversation. And thank you, Kira. Thank you, Rima, Deborah, and Kevin um, for your insights. And um, we really appreciate everyone that joined. Um, like I said, this will be recorded posted on our um, website and also emailed out. So um, look out for that. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. We look forward to seeing you all on the next webinar. Thanks, go vote. Thank go vote. you. Thanks so much for having us.